Today, Mirror, Mirror, the Property Imperative Weekly, the 22nd of February 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the latest post covering finance and prop news with a distinctively Australian flavour. This week, the markets got nervous, China cut rates, and the risks of a crash accelerated. And as normal, we start with the global markets, but if you want to jump direct to the Australian section, the time is shown below. US stocks were lower on Friday as losses in the technology, oil and gas and consumer service segments led shares lower. At the close in New York, the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 0.78% to 28,992, while the S&P 500 Index declined 1.05% to 3,337.75, and the Nasdaq Composite Index lost 1.79% to 9,576.59. The Volatility Index was up 9.77% to 17.08, so fear is rising. Whilst the market's faith in central banks' ability to continue to provide liquidity in case of need remains largely intact, the spread of the coronavirus appears to have picked up pace outside of China, forcing traders to consider whether the impact of the virus will be worse than feared. In more than half of the world's biggest 20 economies, analysts now expect looser budgets this year, in other words, bigger deficits or smaller surpluses, than they did six months ago. The World Health Organization said the window of opportunity to stamp out the virus is closing, as South Korea recorded 380 infections, with southern cities of Dangu and Cheongado declared special care zones. The streets of Dangagu are now largely abandoned and all military bases are in lockdown after three soldiers tested positive. The spread of the disease in Korea and Japan, both countries with advanced health care systems and high population density, is likely to give a reliable indicator of how easily or not the outbreak can be contained outside China. Iran now has its first case of the illness and US officials confirmed 34 cases of COVID-19 in the country. In China, meanwhile, 300 new cases were reported overnight, taking the total around 76,000, and the death toll above 2,000. Chinese companies are already reported extensive shutdowns due to problems with their supply chains, and in Australia, six people from the Diamond Princess cruise ship that was docked off Japan are now confirmed cases. On the economic front, the US services sector unexpectedly contracted this month, raising fears about the strength of the overall US economy. Overall, sales at clothing stores fell 3.1% in January, and that's the biggest drop since March 2009, according to the Commerce Department, while overall core retail sales were unchanged. Central banks in China and Southeast Asia have already loosened policy to support their economies, but there is no sign yet of the Federal Reserve following suit, albeit bond investors appear to be increasing their bets on it doing so, pushing US two-year yields down to 1.38%, well below the current Fed fund rate. The yield on the 30-year Treasury hit an all-time low of only 1.91% earlier this week, and settled at 1.917, and the 10-year settled down to 1.473, and the three-month at 1.559, signalling risk is back on and the curves invert again. Gold jumped as much as 2%, extending its climb to a seven-year high as the S&P 500 index headed for its first weekly loss since January. Goldman said the near-term upside stretched as far as $1,750 but could go as far as $1,850 if the economic impact of the outbreak stretches into the second quarter and triggers a significant response from central banks. Gold futures for April delivery was up 1.57% to $1,645.95. And in a sign that the virus is starting to dent the world's largest economy, 
Business activity in the US shrank in February for the first time since 2013, with the pandemic disrupting supply chains. On Thursday, the International Air Transport Association had warned that the global airline sector would lose around $29 billion in revenue due to the outbreak, the worst hit coming in China and the broader Asian market. Dura's Composite World Container Index decreased by 5.8% to 1575.99 per 40-foot container. Spot rates on trade routes originating from Asia continue to follow a downward trajectory, despite an increase in blank sailings by carrier. However, the blanked sailings will only fend off the downward pressure for so long. Freight rates from Shanghai to Rotterdam and Shanghai to Genoa plummeted 9% and 10% to $1,851 and $2,227 respectively for 40-foot containers. Similarly, Shanghai to Los Angeles and Shanghai, New York lost around $50 and stands at $1,496 and $2,799 per 40-foot boxes. Meanwhile, transatlantic trade rates were hovering around the previous week's rate and they say no upturn in rates is in sight for the next week. Tech and energy were the worst hit on worries about along with an expected disruption of global supply chains and weaker Chinese oil demand. WTI crude oil for delivery in April hit 53.44 a barrel, down 0.82%. And the euro US dollar was up 0.6% to 1.0848. The US dollar futures index was down 0.53% at 99.34. Elsewhere, silver futures hit their highest in six weeks at 18.56, an ounce before retracing to 18.46, up 0.75%. Copper futures, which tends to move inversely to gold, fell 0.44% to $2.60. The US Labor Department said back on January the 16th that it will ban computers from the room where journalists receive advanced access to major economic reports, such as employment and inflation figures, in an effort to ensure a level playing field. They reiterated this plan to restrict journalists' advanced looks at major economic reports without responding in detail to arguments from Bloomberg News and other media organisations that a ban on using computers in secure rooms would imperil wide market access to data. The changes will take effect from March the 1st. In China, Instead of cutting its benchmark overnight interest rates, as some, notably Goldman Sachs, had speculated might happen, the People's Bank of China announced that it would only lower its benchmark one- and five-year lending rates, their loan prime rate, by 10 basis points to 4.05% and 5 basis points to 4.75% respectively. The underwhelming rate cut left analysts asking for more, as consensus emerged that piecemeal lending rate cuts can only help the Chinese economy so much, especially if China is indeed set to unleash fiscal austerity, as local Chinese media reported over the weekend. See our recent post, China, Austerity or Stimulus? To underscore this, despite the biggest one-month credit injection on record, their M2 annual growth rate dropped in February to 8.4%, the People's Bank of China reported its latest monthly credit data with a rise of over 5 trillion yuan or $725 billion. Commenting on the monthly credit data, Goldman said that January's broad credit data mainly reflected the economic conditions and policy stance as the economic impacts from the virus are still rising and because activity data in February will most likely be extremely weak. But even though the coronavirus may have given Beijing just the excuse it needs for a massive debt injection, there is now so much debt in China that it is unlikely that such piecemeal injections will have much of an impact. Ratings agency S&P commented that it sees an economic recovery in China in the third quarter and forecasts that the Chinese economy will expand 5% in the full year, but it also cautioned that the COVID-19 impact could double the amount of questionable loans in China. And there appears to be more evidence of banks being bailed out. The short-term impact of the virus continues to work itself 
on the Chinese economy, pushing the Chinese yuan to a new low for the year at 7.0229 to the dollar. And new car sales fell 92% on the year in the first two weeks of February, according to industry body data. The Shanghai Composite was up 0.31% to 3,039.69. The US dollar has come off multi-year highs against developed market currencies after stronger than expected business surveys out of Europe took the edge off fears about another global economic downturn. Business activity in the Eurozone accelerated more than expected this month, with France's service sector rebounding and German private sector growth also holding steady. The IHS Market Composite Purchasing Managers Index for the Eurozone showed activity at its highest in six months, rising to a preliminary 51.6 from 51.3 in January and defying expectations of a decline to 51. The UK Composite PMI, meanwhile, also came in above expectations, staying at 53.3. These surveys painted a brighter economic picture for now. And British businesses also grew at a solid clip in February, with factories posting the quickest rise in output for 10 months. The pound and euro both came off this week's lows. In response, sterling was trading at 1.2964, up 0.66%, while the euro was back above 108 for the first time in three days to 1.0848 and up 0.6%. HSBC has recorded a pre-tax loss of $3.9 billion in the fourth quarter of 2019 against a pre-tax profit of $3.3 billion in the prior year quarter. The pre-tax loss was primarily impacted by a goodwill impairment charge of $7.3 billion and a UK bank levy charge of $1 billion. The company's initiatives to improve market share in the UK and China I like to support financials over the long term. However, expenses are expected to increase going forward and more jobs are expected to go. Moreover, the weak European economy and the impact of Brexit on financials and litigation expenses will likely continue to curb the bank's near-term growth. Ten-year German government bond yields fell to a four-month low with the entire yield curve on the cusp of turning negative. It landed at minus 0.440, down 1.73%. The moves came at the expense of stocks. Europe's broad Euro stock 600 fell nearly half a percent at one stage, ending 0.49% lower on Friday to 428.08. In Japan, factory activity suffered its steepest contraction in seven years in the clearest evidence yet of the coronavirus's damaging effect. But Bitcoin hit 9,700, up 0.83%, and the demand for crypto gained ground. But it's worth noting an article from Reuters this week because the Fed is developing something called Fedcoin, which would be based on blockchain technology. Fed Governor Lyle Brayard said the Fed is conducting research and experimentation relating to distributed ledger technologies and their potential use case for digital currencies, including the potential for a central bank digital currency, or CBDC. Brayard said the Facebook Libra project imparted urgency to the conversation around digital currencies. We are collaborating with other central banks as we advance our understanding of central bank digital currencies, she said. Less than two years ago, Branyard told a conference in San Francisco that there is, quote, no compelling demonstrated need for such a coin. But now dozens of central banks globally are also doing such work. A recent international study showed with China moving ahead on plans to issue a digital coin. But that was before the scope of Facebook's digital currency ambitions were widely known. Fed officials, including Brenyard, have raised concerns about consumer protections and data and privacy threats that could be posed by a currency that could come into use by a third of the world's population that have Facebook accounts. But as the Economic Policy Journal put it, it appears central banks are beginning to consider how to shut down private cryptocurrencies and introduce their own. 
a Federal Reserve created digital coin could be one of the most dangerous steps ever taken by a government agency. It would put in the hands of the government the potential to create a digital currency with the ability to track all transactions in an economy and prohibit transactions for any reason. In terms of future individual freedom, this would be a nightmare. Of course, they will try to sell it, as Brainyard does, as a step in the direction of delivering, quote, greater value and convenience at lower cost. And that's the point. The agenda here, it seems, is to push transactions away from cash and towards a centrally controlled digital alternative, which can be tracked and controlled. It looks like this is more than conspiracy theory. And one question I have is whether such digital currencies will be stable coins backed by something like gold, or directly linked to the underlying currency, which is what Fedcoin could well be. Hi, it's Liz Interruption, but if you're getting value from this post and have not done so, please consider subscribing to this channel or ring the bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. Alternatively, you can also donate using Bitcoin here is the QR code. The links are in the comments below. I really appreciate your support, which enables us to continue to make more great content. Thanks very much. Now, back to the current show. And so to the local markets. And the big news here was the fall of the Aussie dollar to an 11-year low. It closed down at 66.26 on Friday, having broken the 67 cents barrier following weak employment and jobs data this week. The unemployment rate rose to 5.3% in January, up from 5.1% the previous month in seasonally adjusted terms, and this is the highest reading since October last year. The uptick can partially be explained by an increase in the participation rate to 66.1%, and that's the highest since September, from 66%. In fact, the rest of the jobs report looked encouraging with a net 13,500 jobs added in the month, which was more than the 10,000 that economists had expected. And that was made up of a gain of 46,200 full-time jobs, countered by a loss of 32,700 part-time ones. But this takes us further from the RBA's 4.5% target and signals a potential rate cut ahead. The seasonally adjusted wage price index rose 0.5% in the December quarter and 2.2% through the year, according to the ABS. This extended the period of moderate growth observed throughout 2019 and was influenced by the relative stability of the labour underutilisation rate. Annually, both private and public sector wages rose 2.2% and that was the lowest public sector growth rate since the commencement of the index in December 1997. For the first time since 2012, private sector wages grew at a faster rate than the public sector 0.5 compared with 0.4%. In original terms across industries, annual wage growth ranged from 1.6% for the information, media and telecommunications services sectors to 3.1% for the healthcare and social assistance industries. And Victoria recorded the highest growth through the year of 2.7%, while Western Australia recorded the lowest for the sixth consecutive quarter at 1.7%. So, more signs of weakness. And the latest Roy Morgan employment data showed a further weakening, with a combined unemployment and underemployment rate of 18.4% and the unemployment rate of 9.7%. They, of course, use a different basis to the ABS, but this is not good news. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank has kicked off a $300 million capital raising from institutional clients as it reported a sharp profit drop and has announced it was cutting its interim dividend. Chief Executive Marnie Baker blamed low interest rates and rising regulatory pressure for the steep earnings slide at the release of its half-year result. The bank's statutory net profit was down 28.2%, to $145.8 million, and the company has trimmed its interim dividend from $0.35 cents to $0.31. Cents. The company also reported a 2% drop in cash earnings. Ms Baker said it was a tough decision to cut the dividend, as many retail clients were dependent on those payouts, but added the cut was necessary 
to keep the bank in a sustainable position going forward. The bank's total lending was up 2.8% from the same time last year, with strong demand for residential lending, offsetting drought fueled falls in agricultural lending. Small business lending was also up by 15.6%, while lending applications via its consumer banking division rose by 45% and settlements increased by 35%. The bank was put into a trading halt as it sought to raise funds to support the growth of its residential mortgage business and beef up its investment in technology. Its shares were at 10.02 on Friday. ASIC published their discussion paper on mortgage brokers' best interest duties following the Royal Commission's report. Mortgage brokers will be required to properly investigate a home buyer's circumstances, keep detailed records of loan recommendations, and decline to sell a mortgage if they don't have the right product under the new laws to be introduced at the end of the financial year. ASIC Commissioner Sean Hughes said that the new rules would remove the potential for conflicts of interest and would ensure the interests of the borrowers and the brokers were aligned. Consumers should feel confident that their broker is offering the best loan for their circumstances and we expect that consumer outcomes will improve as a result of this reform, Mr Hughes said. The new rules aim to stop brokers from feathering their own nests at the expense of their customers by selling customers larger mortgages than they need or directing them towards providers who pay bigger commissions. A failure to consider cost and investigate the lowest cost options available to the consumer may suggest non-compliance with the best interest duty. The draft reads... But one thing that is not clear is the minimum commission disclosures. It should be included, in my view. And a new report by the University of New South Wales and the Australian Council of Social Service, or ACOS, claims 13.6% of Australians live in relative poverty after housing costs are taken into account. ACOS's chief executive, Cassandra Goldie, said the low rate of New Start a lack of jobs and unaffordable housing were locking people in poverty. Not only has poverty remained consistently high in our wealthy country, the depth of poverty is getting worse, with households in poverty on average living 42% below the poverty line, up from 35% in 2007, she said. And the University of New South Wales researcher, Professor Bruce Bradbury, said the main drivers of poverty trends were rising housing costs and the rate of social security payments. There have been increases in rents since about 2005, and there has also been a shift in home ownership rates, which has fallen over the past two decades, as has the proportion of people in public housing. Those things have combined, Bradbury told Guardian Australia. And CBA's PMI flash report showed the manufacturing PMI at 49.8 in February, which remains in decline, while the services sector fell away from 50.6 in January to 48.4 in February. This sector fell for the third time in the past four months. And at the quickest rate on record, new business, employment and backlogs of work also fell across the sector, albeit marginally. The rate of input cost inflation, meanwhile, eased further in February, down to a 10-month low. Nonetheless, the increase in operating expenses remained marked and contrasted with only a modest rise in average output charges. And so to home prices. CoreLogic reported that prices continue to rise in most centres, with only Adelaide slipping lower last week. There were quarterly rises in Sydney and Melbourne of 4.6%, according to their index, and prices in Melbourne are nearly back to their peak, though Sydney is still 4.4% down. But as we've noted before, those average figures are not very meaningful. Now, Peter Switzer discussed home prices on his internet show with AMP's Shane Oliver. Some people don't even believe the rebound. Is the rebound for, for real? I think it is, and I've got to admit that if you go back a year ago, I was more negative on property than you were, mm. and it went down for a bit, and then it turned around. Mm. And uh, I think as analysts, uh, we have to admit when we're wrong. Uh, Our and, critics never and, admit when and, they're wrong. I, I know, that, that annoys me a little yeah, bit, yeah. but um, 
when the facts changed, as they did yeah. around the May election, yes. and at about the same time, we had the election on the Saturday, on the Wednesday, I think it was, Philip Lowe was giving a speech where he said, well, you know, next month we're going to consider the case for cutting interest rates, and mm. they did. Yeah. Um, I thought they would cut rates last year, but they cut earlier than I thought, and they cut three By times. By the way, you got the rate cut uh, prediction oh, more thanks. right than I did. Yeah. I can see that. Thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. We, we got that bit right. Um, but I had to concede that at that point in time, May, June, that the facts were starting to change. Yeah. And so I, even though I was worried about the property market going down a lot more, that was my forecast. 25, I thought, yeah, you know, 25% yeah. in Melbourne and nationwide, I think it was somewhere between 10 and 15 thereabouts. Yeah. But um, in the end, I got 15 in Sydney and 11 in Melbourne. So yeah. I'd have to consider. Well done, you uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if I think back to that period, I never thought we were going to get a, an out and out crash that was going to crash the economy. No. Um, because I, I thought that Australians would still be able to service their mortgages and by and large that's what's happened. But of course, the rebound has caught me by surprise, but to then come out and say, well, it's all imagined, it's all made up by the data providers, I think is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the sort of people we used to fail at university, well, I was teaching when you were a student, but that kind of person ultimately would have got failed at university. Yeah, they, they wouldn't have made it through uni. No. I mean, it's just nonsensical to say to people who are out there in Sydney and Melbourne on a Saturday trying to bid at a house that the property market hasn't turned up when they're surrounded by people, other people bidding for the properties <laughs> oh, yeah, right. and the price goes, the house goes for 100, 200, 300 over. Mm. Um, so if you look at the evidence here, it's panned out the way property recoveries often pan out. Mm. Yeah, if you buyers start getting in there at the low, low point, auction clearance rates start going up. Yeah. The auction clearance rate starts going up and then eventually, uh, some more sellers come along and the volumes start to pick up. But it's usually happening with a lag. But that's now starting to happen. You have seen in the latter part of last year, you saw a pick up in volumes. Mm. Sales were starting to follow the price up. And likewise, since the middle of last year, we've seen housing finance commitments. This is commitments by banks to people to borrow for a home yeah. rise about 20%. I think it's 21% precise mm. number. So yeah. pretty strong turnaround there. Now, that to me, those three things would suggest the property market has turned around. Yeah. And then when you look at the house price data put together by both Domain and CoreLogic, and don't forget these organisations spend a lot of money collecting this data. If they were making it all up, it's a very expensive operation just to make some data up. Sure. So they go out there and collect the data. Nothing's foolproof, there's always errors there, um, but it gives you a pretty good guide. Yeah. And then it, later on it's backed up by the ABS data which has come out. It's also pointed to a turnaround. So whether you like it or not, yeah. Um, the reality is, we have to be objective here, the property market has turned up. I wonder who they were talking about. But to illustrate the point that there is in fact alternative data out there, Lindsay David from LF Economics examined movements from May 2019 to February 2020 in Sydney and found a considerable variation and an average rise of just 0.65%. And that's the point. Averages mask. Not every home price in Sydney and beyond is rising. The auction clearance rates from last weekend from CoreLogic reported a weighted average result of 73.3% on 1,596 scheduled auctions and with Melbourne slightly ahead of Sydney. Last year, there was a 51.2% result on 1,450, so buyers are more active this time around. And so do the markets. The ASX closed at 5,917.80, down 0.3%. And that was from an all-time high before. The financials index was at 6,494.30, up 0.51%, while the local volatility index was up 2.23% to 12.67. The Aussie was at 66.26 against the US dollar, while the Euro Aussie was at 1.6359, up 0.4%. The Gold Aussie Cross was at 2,480.11, up 1.23%, and the Aussie Bitcoin cross was at 14,665, up 0.03%. And so to conclude, looking into the mirror, what do you see? Do you see yourself, or do you see a reflection of something that looks like yourself? That's how I feel at the moment as I look at the markets. I consider that we are seeing a reflection of what's going on, but it may not be a very accurate one because the markets are still buoyed up by the prospect of central banks bailing everybody out. 
And I'm going to come back to that in more detail in a separate post. But in fact, John Adams and I made a post recently where we went into some detail to explain why it is that the central bank interventions, particularly in the US, have really triggered a crisis which is already coming. And you can see our post if you want more detail on that. But meantime, buckle in, because the next few weeks are going to be an interesting ride, and I think that mirror may crack. We will see. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.